Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Welcome. We don't get older, we get better. <laughs> but what are the steps to preserving our youthfulness when we do get better? And I would like to welcome Rebecca Eddy so she can guide us through what we can expect going forward in our life. Rebecca, welcome. Thank you, Barry, for having me. My pleasure. Let's start at the beginning. What do you do? I'm a financial organizer, and uh, my, I and my company, we go into people's homes, and we work with them on managing their personal, financial, legal, and health insurance matters. This is basically for seniors, or is it all over the board? It, we work also with high net worth busy professionals, but our real focus is on seniors. All right, what is the name of your company? Eddie and Shine, in-home administrators for seniors. Now, <clears throat> this is a topic, I don't know where to start. Do we start with the baby boomers who are <clears throat> transitioning into uh, retirement and then seniors or the baby boomers who are part of the sandwich generation? Where do you start when you're trying to plan your next step? Often people who are baby boomers and are sandwich generation are doing both simultaneously. They're having to deal with older family members or neighbors, and they're also having to think about, or should be thinking about, what life's gonna be like when they get older and to make sure that they're prepared. Did your personal <laughs> history make you choose this as a career or how did it come about? Well, um, I actually had an MBA. I worked at Moody's Investors Service and then I was raising my daughter, took a break, I was raising my daughter and when she was four, someone asked me to pay their bills while they were out of the country for six months. The husband was a venture capitalist. The woman was an interior designer, and they were traveling for his work, and so I was paying their bills, but she's still my client 25 years later. And she, so I worked for her, I worked for another person, but simultaneously I was also, had a job with the New York Festival of Song, and that's how I got to know my business partner, Gideon Shine. And then when I decided I wanted to build the business, Gideon and I went into business together. And so, it sort of, we fell into it in a way, and he also did because he took care of his mother, his mother's best friend, and, and uh, a man who was in his 90s who was on our board of directors. And it's, it's a very normal way for people to end up in this profession, that they get engrossed in taking care of family members or neighbors and discover that they have a knack for it. Is this something that you need to be licensed for, or do you carry insurance yourself to protect you, or do you go to get a degree? <laughs> In our company, everybody pretty much has an MBA, but uh, that's not necessarily the case. In the industry, there's the American Association of Daily Money Managers, and it has about 800 people in it. It was started at least 25 years ago. And they have a certification program, and you can become a professional daily money manager. So Gideon and I both became professional daily money managers, and the rest of our staff are working towards that certification. There are a lot of people who don't have the certification, who've been doing the work for a long time, and they have the skills, but we decided we would go for that certification, and that means we get renewed every three years, and, but we're not licensed, it's not a licensure. Um, I'm fortunate to be by myself, or unfortunate, depends on which way you look at it. Mm -hmm. All right, what should I have in place for myself? And because I had a neighbor who was by herself, she was widowed, and things progressed with her that she was deteriorating. And because even though we're on the, we were on the same floor, I would look at her and ask, what's wrong? Can I help you? And it was like, you know, she didn't want to be helped or anything like that. And then you get busy, or rather I got busy with my own life. So I 
saw her, but he didn't see her enough. And it was like, oh, who are these people who are in her house now and cleaning up her apartment and taking over her life? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do I protect myself or maybe what could I have done for her? I mean, it's a quite a question here. It's a big question. Yes. <laughs> and it's one that we're dealing with a lot as a lot of especially professional single women are aging and they don't have uh, they don't have family members maybe they don't have nieces and nephews that they can count on or children and so they're looking to figure out how they can develop a support system for themselves as they age and do and see the same kind of and they decline the way they're seeing other people decline around them like your neighbor and so First of all, you want to start with making sure that you've got a health care proxy and a power of attorney. And you want both, at least one of in each case, to be somebody who's present in the area where you live. So in this case, in New York City. And you want to have a backup person, because if for some reason the other pers first person isn't available, you want to have somebody else. Those are the things that are important for living. You obviously need to have a will because anybody who passes away without a will, it gets very complicated for the people who get left behind. But in terms of caring about how you live out your life, you want to make sure that you have the, the foundation for having people who can step in and take over at the point where you're no longer able to take care of yourself. So if, okay, so I need a healthcare proxy. Mm -hmm. And what was the other power one? of attorney? Power of attorney. Do you want somebody who's older than you, or younger, or the same age? Preferably younger. We never know how long people are going to live, but if you have somebody who's older, and one of the first things that often gives way is financial skills. So having somebody who's a power of attorney, who may actually be declining in that area before you are. It's not necessarily the best thing. Although I keep wishing we had a crystal ball for everybody because we don't know whether somebody's going to have Alzheimer's or whether it's going to be a heart attack and they're going to pass away right away or cancer. We just don't know what's going to cause declines for people. So some people are very sharp and able to take care of their finances well into their 90s. And then all of a sudden something happens and they're not able to. So I would tend to go for someone younger and again have another backup. All right, so, all right, because I'm in the situation where I have family, but I don't have, like, nieces and nephews. Mm -hmm. What about if something happens as far as going to the hospital? I guess that that's the health care proxy. All right. So you want to have somebody who knows your wishes for how you should be taken care of in a hospital and be able to represent you well. Somebody that should have some kind of uh, I could say they don't need a medical background if that's what you mean or <laughs> are referring to no I was just thinking somebody who's very aggressive because I noticed when I was taking care of somebody in the hospital it was like a tag team because they would not listen to me because I was a lay person and I didn't have a medical degree or nor was I an attorney so how do you come around that in a hospital Knowing that you have power in having that health care proxy is really important and and standing up for your friend or your relative and saying, I am the health care proxy. These are the things I want to see and and really asking questions and being on top of people, keeping track of medications and when medication should be given or different things. My father was in pain, so they gave him a pill, and it was different than the one he had, and he went loopy. And we didn't know why he was going loopy, and they said that it was uh, a result of being in the hospital, just the change in location. And we said, you don't know our father? So we made them go through every new medication that they had given him, and they just identified it, and they were able to eliminate it, and he got better. So we now, after that, anytime he went into the hospital, we made sure that they put on that he was allergic to that medication. So it was, but we literally had to just 
keep on the doctors or the nurse practitioner until they came, they understood what we were trying to do. It sounds like when my mother was in the hospital, they gave her some medication. My mother said, that's not my medication. And the person who was, I guess it was a nurse who was fighting with her and said, yes, it is. And she would not take it and it wasn't her medication. And it's like, it's frightening. Okay, we're not gonna go there. It's very <laughs> frightening. You need a patient advocate, you need a healthcare proxy person. What else would you need in the hospital? So I recommend that, any, that anybody that's really dealing with this involve a geriatric care manager. So you may have the healthcare proxy, but you also bring in somebody who really knows how to work within the hospital system and also knows about discharge at the end of the stay in the hospital because often people are discharged from hospitals either to a rehab and it's not a good choice of rehabs and you're given the names of three and told to pick and how do you know what, which is the right one? And or you're discharged, your friend or your, your family member's discharged home, and if, if somebody hasn't figured out exactly what's the right setup at, the, at home, they could be going back and then getting, coming back into the hospital again because there's a fall or there's, they're not taking their medications properly or they're just not having enough assistance. So having a geriatric care manager who's skilled at handling all those transitions is really valuable. That's that's part of, we believe very strongly in ha building a team of professionals to support seniors and to support the family members who are caring for their seniors. And geriatric care managers is high on our list. And obviously, from our point of view, financial organizers or daily money managers are important. And having an elder law attorney who can help guide decisions about whether somebody needs to become Medicaid eligible, having aides who are on payroll, so either through an agency or if you pay them privately that you get a payroll accountant. And I, so there are people that you wouldn't normally think of to have on your team that you add to your team as you get older. Almost as if you starting a corporation with all these people here. I mean, my God. Well, okay, let's go back to the financial part. You come out of the hospital, and when we were talking, you said something about three-month look back and a five-year look back as far as protecting your assets. That's about Medicaid. Okay. And so if somebody does need to go on Medicaid and... In New York State, and specifically New York City, it's the best place to go on Medicaid. In New York State, there's a three-month look back, uh, which means they just Medicaid uh, bureaucracy, the Medicaid um, organization needs to see three months worth of financial records to see where you've been putting, how you've been using your money for three months. And if you're going into a nursing home, there's a five-year look back. And so you have to show five years worth. And they wanna see how, when you've transferred money into a trust or to family members or how you've been using it. So it's a much more rigorous process. And living in community, in your home, this three month look back is pretty easy to do. The application is complicated and very thick and we always encourage you to, a person to get an elder law attorney involved to do that process. But there are real decisions that have to be made about whether, whether to put money in a trust or give it to a family member that you trust. Uh, and, and because any time you start the Medicaid process, we like to believe people are gonna live in their homes for the rest of their lives. But there may be the possibility they will end up in a nursing home. So the sooner the Medicaid eligibility process is begun, the better because then the clock starts for that five year look back that, that might happen if you end up in a nursing home. You brought up a very interesting mm. comment. You said, somebody you trust. There is so much elder abuse right. and elder fraud. How does one protect themselves? Vigilance, looking over bank statements, opening bank statements for starters. A lot of people 
don't even open their bank statements. The, the envelope comes and it just gets shoved in a drawer, putting them with a pile of papers. So, for instance, we had a client recently who we were, we started going through their, her bank statements and reconciling them every month. And one of our staff identified that, in fact, there was a social security check missing. It hadn't been deposited, and it was on auto, auto deposit, automatic deposit. And so we aren't the power of attorney. We went to her power of attorney and, and called the bank and found out that it had been diverted to some other bank account. And so then we were able to get the power of attorney to go to Social Security on her behalf, on the client's behalf, and, and get everything resolved. If we hadn't been watching, this could have been going on for months. It was just a one-month glitch. And so there's really importance that, important that we are looking over bank statements, looking over credit card statements. If you have a smartphone or email, you can have alerts done if you're, and pick an amount, you know, if, if something is charged over $100 or if it's charged without a credit card or whatever, you can have an alert. And so then you know that anything above $100 is, uh, you want to check it out and make sure that it's legitimate. It's interesting because I have heard of a case where I was going to interview a, an attorney and she <clears throat> said, I can't do it. I've got to attend to this client of mine who I think, um, what was, I forget what she called it, but he had home aides mm -hmm. and she, he was giving money to the home aides and I said, that's elder abuse. She's, and you know, it's elder fraud, it's elder abuse. And she just went crazy because I don't know what happened, but you know, that's when you get, I guess, the district attorney's office in. Right. But the thing of it is, the person has to <clears throat> want to prosecute. I mean, how right. can anybody do anything if you're not prosecuting? There have been times where People have been taking more than they should if they're helping. A, a lot of times, aides are doing something which isn't the approved thing, which is to help people with their finances, help them write their checks or go to the bank and use their ATM card because clients have lost some, or the person's lost some capacity, their client has lost some capacity. And then there may be abuse. So we've had several cases where there's suspected abuse, and we've been brought in to start writing the checks, getting the cash that gets given to the aid to buy food. And so just in a quiet kind of way, we put an end to the process of, of any possible abuse that might be happening. So yeah, there is a lot of abuse, and it comes in a lot of different forms. There's something called a sweetheart. Um, Sweetheart fraud, I think it is. Anyway, it's a case where perhaps a woman um, befriends an old elderly man and they go out to dinner and oh. they have lovely time together. And then eventually she starts to say that she's got an elderly mother who needs an operation or she herself has some woman problems and needs money for the doctor and whatever it is. And these men will go to the bank and take out $5,000 at a time and give it to the women. And so in two cases recently, we've stepped in and been able to, one by being a presence, changing the bank so she wasn't avail able to, when we weren't around, walk him to the bank because he didn't have access to the other bank. Or <clears throat> And in the other case, actually brought in a detective who the woman used to come on a regular basis. So family members and the police were there when the woman arrived and she was caught and prosecuted. So it's, um, but it takes having some people who are able to be vigilant enough, again, that word vigilance, and, and recognize. So the man that I was working with, where the woman was taking him to the bank, um, the financial, he, he started calling his financial advisor and asking for more, more money than he used to ask to be transferred from his, investments into his checking account and she got suspicious and started to ask questions and then she got me got Eddie and Shine involved. Were you his <laughs> client 
before or she just brought you in? He was not my client before she brought, brought us in. Now, was he grateful or was he upset? What was his reaction? Well, he just loved the company. So I was there, he enjoyed my company. <laughs> Um, he didn't really remember or understand that the woman was taking advantage of him when we would explain it to him and tell him that he really shouldn't be going out with her or giving her money and we would locked up any cash. We would give him small amounts of cash and lock up anything else. So he just sort of, she, once there wasn't a money source, she didn't come around as much or at all as far as I know. <clears throat> What else should one consider when you're preparing ahead? Because you don't like you have nobody or you have children. Do you tell the children? Are they apt to take your money away? What? Hopefully you have children that you can trust who are capable and able to do the work that's needed or you have children who are willing to allow somebody else to come in like one of us, one of my colleagues, to come in and do the work on their behalf. Because sometimes family members are well-meaning, but they don't, one, they don't know the ropes the way we do, and secondly, they don't have time, or they just don't have the competency. They may be brilliant, they may be creative, but they may not be really interested in checking bank statements and reconciling. Or they, in terms of time, they just don't want to spend their time dealing with their parents' nitty-gritty financial stuff, and they'd rather spend time socializing. <laughs> Another piece is that there are a lot of times there's baggage. And so even if somebody's very capable as the adult, uh, adult child, parents don't want to share or there's some embarrassment about things or they may not even feel like the child, the adult child is that capable. So bringing in a professional often is a helpful way to cut through all of that because they'll be often very open to having a professional do what they won't allow their children to do. Some people are very open with their children and others are like oh, you don't have to worry about that, and then all of a sudden a crisis happens, right. and you don't know where to start. And so what ends up happening is the children have to come in and start digging through papers and doing a lot of what I call sleuthing, because they've just got to identify what all the bank, statement, bank accounts are, what kinds of investments there are, are there annuities, are there IRAs, are there trusts that they weren't told about, is there a will? Is there a power of attorney? Is there a health care proxy? And then they have to scurry around and try to figure all uh, how to get it all in place and, and make sense of it. And often they're dealing with it at the same time that they're dealing with the medical issues. So I have, for instance, just been involved with a woman who is in rehab for the fourth time in four months. She gets home, she falls, ends up back in the hospital, ends up back in rehab. And when I was talking to her, I, I asked her what kind of assets she had. She was, I was brought in by a friend. And she said that she had $10,000 in her savings account and $6,000 in her checking account. And, but there was some money that was coming from a trust, I mean like $800 a month. I thought, okay, I'm not sure what kinds of support we can put in place, but she clearly needs a geriatric care manager to help her with her transitions again to going home and making a decision about whether her home is safe enough or whether she needs to move in, she's in a walk-up, and or does she need to be in an elevator building, Where does she, or does she need to be in assisted living? Don't know but I'd rather have a geriatric care manager doing that side of the but Meanwhile, her friend let us into the home and we gathered up all of the papers and started to find out that in fact, she's got probably over $150,000 in various annuities and IRAs. And then there's a trust fund. And then she had said she had some property down south. Well, I thought maybe 10 acres. It's more like 
110 acres. So, and she knows she wants to sell it. So we're working on all of these fronts. I'm talking constantly with the geriatric care manager that was brought in at the same time, trying to take care of the financial side of it. We found some stale checks. Those checks will get, we will work on getting those replaced. So clearly in the last seven, eight months, she's lost some of her ability to follow through on things she was doing before. But she had been putting aside little bits of money into all these different accounts. So at some point she had some handle on her finances. Was she opposed to you handling her finances? Or how did she take that? I mean, She's been resistant um, when her friend has brought it up in the past, but she recognized after the fourth visit to the ER that it might be time to get some people involved. And so she's been very open to having us involved and having the geriatric care manager participate in her care. What would you say are, what, 10 steps that seniors can avoid that um, will impact their lives? I don't have them memorized, <laughs> <laughs> but we, and we've touched on a lot of them already. Right. Getting your legal documents in place is important. Having somebody who can help handle your medical affairs, so that's the geriatric care manager. Having um, somebody as a backup to be able to handle your checking account and, and finances, day-to-day -day finances, so that we've talked about as a financial organizer or daily money manager. Having really thinking about what your lifestyle is going to be going forward. So really, people need to start about start doing this or dealing with it when they're in their 20s and 30s, putting money into IRAs or whatever is recommended by their 401ks, maxing out that to the degree that one can. In other words, really starting to put money aside for retirement. And at midlife, also buying long-term care insurance if possible so that it will help to handle the cost of long-term care when it's needed. And, and let's see what other things are there. Um, it, just making sure that you've got the right insurance in place, having payroll being paid for if you have privately paid people. What about um, having your where you want to die, where you want to be buried. What about the afterlife? <laughs> <laughs> I would love it if more people put some attention on that. It's a really hard one. We have a hard enough time getting people to write their wills. But if they could identify where they'd like to be buried, what kind of a service or no service they want, and cremation versus um, a casket, all of those things would be very helpful to family members to be able to do, to make it much easier to them move faster. The nice thing about Medicaid is that part of what you can do in the period when before you become eligible is set up a um, pre-planned funeral trust and I may not be phrasing it exactly right, but you can work with a funeral parlor and put aside the money to arrange for all of your needs. And so it's, one, it's, a, it's an item that family members, you just have to let the family members know where the information is. <laughs> and then they can immediately call the funeral parlor and everything's taken care of. And it also means that the family members don't have to take money out of their pocket, which often has to happen after somebody passes away because money has, because a state hasn't been set up yet. So it's, uh, it's a very helpful thing to do a pre-planned um, trust or some kind of a planning with a funeral parlor. You haven't died yet, but you've retired. Mm -hmm. What do you say you should budget for or not or include or how does one go about doing that? You want to think about what your daily expenses are going to be. I joke with my husband, but only half joke that people should have, that we should set up a uh, medical account or dental account actually is more important because often you have through, you'll have your Medicare and then you'll have a secondary insurance of some sort that'll pay for the, the gap between what Medicare will pay and what the bill is. And 
you'll have a prescription plan through Medicare D, called Medicare D, but dental is very rarely covered, and people, I don't, I think people outlive their teeth a lot of times. <laughs> and so dentists are very expensive and you're having to do major repairs. So, and so client, and so seniors have a tendency not to focus on their teeth because it's so expensive. So I, I, I joke, but I, I'm serious about the fact that it's helpful to have a, <laughs> a little, Slush fund? A little slush fund for your <laughs> dental, so you know that you've got money to pay for the dentist. <laughs> but um, medical expenses are very high, um, whether it's that you're paying for Medicare and you're paying for insurance and secondary insurance and Medicare D and sometimes co-pays, depending on which kind of insurance you've gotten. So, and long-term care. So if you end up in a nursing home or if you have to have round the clock care for with AIDS, that can run you hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars a year. So it and it depends on whether they're live in or whether you have two twelve hour shifts. It just there's a lot of factors that are involved, but it um, gets to be expensive. So planning ahead for that. And that's where I really encourage people to look seriously at long term care insurance. It's expensive, but it in the long run, it may be very worthwhile. What things should you look for when you look at a long-term care package? Okay, that's a whole other <laughs> talk. <laughs> but um, so there's a lot of things that go into it. Whether a um, you you pick an amount that you can afford, or that but let's say for instance, it costs three hundred dollars a day to have home health aides at this point. Then and I'm just picking a number. At the, uh, then you want to start with that, and then you want to build in inflation. So some packages provide for that, but it costs the premiums are higher for that. If you, and then you have choices about whether there's a 30-day elimination or 90-day elimination period, which is a waiting period before your uh, long-term care insurance goes into play, and how many years worth you want to have and. Uh, and since we believe very strongly that people are going to live a lot longer than, let's say, three years or something that you might, that might be the average for a nursing home, if they're living at home, they may live a lot longer. You would want to go for as much as you can. So it's there's a lot of factors, and it gets kind of complicated. But it's worth having a broker lay out lots of different plans for you and show you how all the moving parts work to come up with a premium that you think you can afford got our finances all in shape here. We have got a geriatric manager. Mm -hmm. We've got you for our finances. But how do we decide where we're going to live? Okay. Ideally, you'll live in the home that you're in and you'll live out your life that way, but there are a lot of factors that go into that. So for instance, I talked about the woman who lives in a walk-up and as she becomes less capable of managing the stairs, we have to really consider whether she can live in a walk-up anymore. If you're in a home where you can put in a staircase glide, a gliding, you know, the seat that goes up and down the stairs, then it may be a possibility. Sometimes your apartment or your house can be renovated to be totally accessible on one floor and it's easy to get in and out of. So thinking constantly as you start to work on your middle life instead of the senior life is what whether I can really live out my whole life here would be a good thing. So if you're building a new house and it's got a beautiful view from the second floor, so you want to have your living room and your kitchen and dining room up there, think about whether you'll be able to get up there when you're older. And another thing is New York City is a great place to age. It has cabs and buses that are easy to get in and out of. It has food easily at your <laughs> fingertips, your dialing tips. It has great medical care, AIDS. And so a lot of people are actually moving back to New York City to, to retire. And it means that you don't have to drive, which is a really big issue, an issue that we and our company don't deal with a whole lot in terms of taking away the keys from parents, which some some do. Yeah. You know, people in the suburbs have to deal with that with their grand, their parents. So, um, 
we really encourage people to think about where they want to age and live out their lives. And it may be that when they're ready to downsize, it's just downsizing to an elevator building again. And as opposed, it may not be living in an assisted living facility or it might be living in an assisted living facility, but there are pros and cons to each option. And so thinking those through, maybe talking with Again, a geriatric care manager is a good resource to think through what might happen. And sometimes it's worthwhile just to hire a geriatric care manager for an assessment, even at an early age, mid age, middle age, to help you think through things. And it's not that you'll continue to use that person, but they will be able to help guide you in making some decisions about your living choices. Well, Rebecca, there's mm. so much to think about <laughs> as you progress in one's age. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. In the closing moments of the show, what would you like to leave the audience with? I think planning ahead and the need for vigilance as at any time of your life, but especially being vigilant for the uh, with those people that you care about to make sure that their finances are not being mishandled. Almost like making sure your own finances aren't mishandled too, right. because there's even with the caregivers who come in. And the sweethearts, as you were talking about, which I got to tell somebody about. <laughs> thank you so, thank you so much for You're joining very me. Very welcome. Thank it's you. Been really an interesting and enlightening. <laughs> A lot of things to think about. Okay. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Love to hear from you and what you're doing about planning for your future. Write us here at the Woman's Connection. Bye now.